This week on This is America and the World, we're continuing our conversation with David Finkel. He's a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist for The Washington Post and a 2012 MacArthur Fellow. David is also the author of the new book, Thank You for Your Service. I feel confident that these are not only truthful stories, but they legitimately get at the emotions of the soldiers themselves. But, but of course, you know, I, I, I care about these people. And, and this, is, this is serious, profound stuff, what's going on. And, and, and look, we can, we, can, we can do what we want with the information we've been given about these wars in the afterwar. We can look at it, we can look away, we can ignore it, uh, we can do something about it. Uh, the attempt in these books, I didn't think a single person would read these books because there's, there's not a lot of interest in these wars to begin with. You know, that hasn't been the case. They have been read. But the attempt in Thank You for Your Service is to take this ubiquitous phrase, this thing that we all say, and, and, and put grit underneath it, that, that if you read the stories of these people between the covers of this book, that when you finish, you know, if I've done my job, these people will be so in mind that if you say that phrase again, the next time you say it, you'll have a better sense of who you're thanking, what you're thanking them for. So that's, that's the attempt. And, and of, uh, yes, I mean, I'm affected by this. Mm. Uh, and I hope I stay affected by it. It's probably changed your life as well. But let's okay. hold that till a little later. Thank you. Okay. When... Sergeant Schumann comes home. We see on television uh, the doors open, the soldiers come in, the families run up, right. uh, kids hugging, balloons. Didn't happen that way for, for him. Sergeant Schumann, did no. it? No. It happened in the other guys in the battalion. Uh, Didn't happen with him? No, because he came home halfway through. It was just a guy on a flight from, uh, from Texas to uh, a little airport outside of Fort Riley. And uh, it's small enough that you get off the plane and you walk down some steps and then you walk across the, uh, the tarmac and come into the terminal. And, uh, and it's interesting because as Adam was walking across, we talk about the invisible war. Well, here's the thing. He's a wounded guy, but like so many folks, he doesn't believe it because when he looks in the mirror, he doesn't, everything's in perfect symmetry. Mm -hmm. Two ears, two arms, two legs. Nothing's wrong. Nothing's missing. And so many times he would say, I just wish I had a physical injury so I could really believe what the doctors are saying, mm. that there's something wrong with me. How about the girl, the young girl who wanted to dye her hair blue? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, her the, father did, father was physically injured. Was for, yes. Uh, uh, terribly by a roadside bomb. And there was a day in this family where, where a daughter, I think she was, what, 14 years old or so, um, told her mom she wanted to dye a strand of her hair blue. And the mother said, you know, we don't do this in this family. We're not trash. Mm -hmm. Why do you want, and the kid kept insisting, insisting, insisting. And finally the mother said, what's the deal? She said, I'm just trying to do something so that when we go to Walmart, maybe people will look at me instead of daddy. Wow. Uh, for the folks who are just joining us, we want to make sure that they know we're talking about two million uh, Americans having served in Iraq and uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, most of them come home okay, but a huge number, about 25%, 500,000 uh, invisible wounds of war. We're right. talking about the psychology of war, the, yes. the trauma of these people. When uh, Sergeant uh, Schumann uh, gets off the plane, uh, there's a new uh, person we want to talk about, mm -hmm. and that's Amanda, Amanda Duster. Amanda Duster. Duster. Yes. Uh, she's right there. What's her question to Adam as he steps off the plane? Yeah, Adam hadn't met her. Um, and suddenly, in this, in this homecoming, before he even has a chance to uh, have a moment and hug his wife, there's this other woman saying, tell me what happened. What happened to my husband? What happened? Uh, and there's a series of questions in the book that are the reported questions uh, Amanda remembers asking in that moment. Mm -hmm. um, but the deal was, right, uh, uh, this might have been the final straw for Adam. Uh, he was beginning to suspect he wasn't doing well over there. They got a, uh, 
a new sergeant, a new platoon sergeant, this guy James Doster. And he and Adam just took to each other right away. A uh, uh, lot of respect for each other. And uh, Adam was feeling uh, better. And there was a mission one day, and Adam, you know, this guy would take the first truck, right front seat. He just had such great eyes. He always found the bombs. But for various reasons, he didn't go on the mission that day. Somebody else sat in that seat. A bomb went off, and it went into James Doster, and, uh, and James Doster died. And when I was reading the excerpt earlier, when the guy said to Adam, none of this shit would have happened if you were there, that concerned the death of James Doster. And right. the guy said it to Adam. He meant it as a compliment. He did, didn't he? Yes, yes but, he did. But it was impossible for Adam to hear it that way. It was, it was, if, it was, we, and, if you had been spotting that day, the guy would you be would alive. have seen it. Yeah, but this he, is on you, pal. Yeah, but he interpreted, and what a sense of guilt. Huh? Sure, sure. But, 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 th so this is the thing. If it's, you would have been there, this wouldn't have happened. It, and it was meant as a compliment, but yes. it was heard as an accusation. Yes. And, and so, so in, in all the people present in this book, whether they're wives or girlfriends, uh, soldiers, if there's one thing in common, all feel um, uh, uh, a sense of guilt over something. And, and sometimes the something is something that would make no logical sense to us. We're talking about guilt. We're talking about nightmares. We're talking about night sweats. We're talking about panic attacks. We're talking about abuse, alcoholism. Uh, yeah, but wait, wait, wait. can I tell a quick story about yeah. another soldier? Uh, let me just take a little break, okay. uh, but hold it. Who, who's the soldier you're going to... Cicillo Ayeti. Okay. Because uh, it's an interesting guy to talk to about the meanings of guilt. We're going to take a little break. Uh, talking with David uh, Finkel of the Washington Post, uh, an incredibly important, brilliant book. Uh, thank you for your service. Uh, and uh, you've picked up the thread of our conversation right now. Pulitzer Prize winner David is MacArthur uh, awardee. Uh, he also uh, author of a previous book called uh, The Good Soldiers, and my belief and rec recall is that New York Times said it was one of the most important books, best books when it came out. Uh, we'll take a little break. Back on the other side, This is America and the World. Don't go away. This is America is brought to you by the National Education Association the U.S.-China Education Trust, and the F.Y. Chang Foundation. The League of Arab States, representing 350 million people in 22 member countries. The Rotondaro Family Trust. The Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy, presenting international artists in diplomatic settings and Ventana Productions, television facilities, editing, and distribution services. You're on. Okay. Introduce us yeah. to yet another well, person sure, because that it, you know that you yeah, were embedded with. I was, and, 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 and I, was, I was, the day I met Tosolo Ayeti, I wasn't out in the convoy that day. Say uh, his name. Uh, Tosolo Ayeti. From uh, uh, American, American Samoa. Samoa. Yeah, huh? great guy. And... Uh, so he's in this Humvee. The Humvee um, uh, gets blown sky high by, by three uh, buried bombs. You know, what I was saying before, the guy with the trigger, perfect timing. The thing goes up in the air, comes down hard on this road. Uh, Ayeti gets out of the Humvee. He has a broken leg, but he gets out of the Humvee, and then he realizes there are still guys inside. So despite the broken leg, he makes his way back to the Humvee, as it's catching on fire now. And listen, as it catches on fire, this is not a benign thing. It's not just a fuel tank to worry about. There are a couple thousand rounds of ammo inside this Humvee as well. And, and they're gonna start cooking off. He makes his way back, along with a couple of other guys, one other guy in particular. They pull out two more soldiers who were badly injured. And then nobody gets to the driver, a 19-year-old guy who burns to death in his seat, mm. and uh, nobody can get to him. So I met Ayeti that day, not in the convoy, but when they came down to the aid station, uh, I was there. And uh, while they worked on the other guys, Ayeti was kind of by himself. So I stayed with him for some time. And, uh, and then I just happened to be with him 
when somebody walked by and he said, so what about Harrelson? And the guy shook his head, and that's when Ayeti understood that 19-year-old James Harrelson had, had, had died. Mm. What I didn't know uh, uh, until a couple of years later is Tesola began having dreams at that point. Uh, and it was this, well, I shouldn't say dreams, a dream. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was the same dream, and it was at least weekly, as he later described it to me. Here was the dream. James Harrelson, on fire, saying to Ayeti, why didn't you save me? Okay, so that's, that's a dream of guilt. Yes. Now, now, I think it's fair to say if you and I were in that battalion, in that convoy, we would hope we would be able to behave like Ayeti did in that moment. Broken leg, makes his way back, helps drag out two guys. And I remember saying to him, do you ever dream about the guys you saved? And mm. he said, apparently that's yeah. not what my dreams are for. So it's the guy who's died. The guy who died. And eventually and, and, you and have dream, that dream. And he told no one. And the dream was, why didn't why you didn't save, save me? Why didn't you save me? Why didn't you save me? The guy directly yeah. to, to Solo while he's on fire. Over, over, over this dream. Yeah. So what happened eventually is, is Ayeti uh, uh, broke down. And, and he had to dream one too many times. And he kind of wrecked his apartment. And he had to be hospitalized for a brief time. And... Uh, and then he went into a seven-week PTSD program and uh, where everybody was calling him a hero. And every, you know, everyone believed it except to Solo himself. So when we talk about shades of guilt, in some cases the guilt was for, there's one guy who kept saying, I feel guilty because I behaved like a monster over there. And then there's the other version, another version, which is Adam Schumann's feeling guilty that he had to leave. And then there's Ayeti's version, which is, I didn't save the guy on fire, even though he behaved so, I think, wonderfully that moment. And then the wives and the kids and Amanda just, uh, they call it a death gratuity. Yeah, uh, so but, Amanda. But she calls it blood money. She, on her bad day, she calls it blood money. And anger, on, her, on her good day, uh, she calls it oops money. So she has a sense money, of humor. Yeah, but yeah. underlying Amanda Doster, three years after her husband's death, is, is a sense of, wonder, curiosity, and I, I, I go so far to say her own version of guilt that she's not better. Everyone's saying, enough already, get over it, yeah. but she can't. And, and the fact that everyone's saying get over it only, only compounds her frustration with herself. Feeling of a, a, a loneliness, and, a loneliness and a hopelessness, and uh, one commander said, uh, uh, saddest, saddest, it's called it widow eyes, huh? Widow eyes. Well, I remember when, you know, I didn't widow meet, I, uh, I, I, I was with the commander in Iraq when he called Amanda to, to yeah. she already knew her husband was dead, but yeah. he called her to offer uh, 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 sympathy. And he hung up and he said, that may be the saddest woman I've talked to yet. Um, so a dream, I should have saved him. Images, there's Iraqis in the bathtub. Thoughts, uh, I, I feel like a monster. Yeah. Uh, no surprise that, uh, no surprise that they don't want to talk about it or can't talk about it. Right, huh? right. Yeah, no surprise. Uh, they can talk to uh, each other sometimes about it, but, but, but talking about it, it's, it's, but isn't that the case with, with, I mean, don't we all have a relative who served and came home and never yeah. really talked about it? Never wanted to talk about it. Right. Absolutely right. But such a sense of camaraderie. There. Yes. Yes. And, 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 and uh, someone uh, in the book uh, talks about it being so lonely once they get home. Because you come home and you're basically on your own. There's a line in the book of the truth of war is eventually you're in it for the guy next to you. Mm -hmm. The truth of the after war is you're, you're pretty much on your own. And most men don't have male friends. They have their wives. They have their girlfriends. They don't share in the same way. No. So it's all bottled up inside. I huh? think that's fair. I Tell think that's us a fair about thing to James say. Gardner and the Gardner Room. Well, Gardner, he was a, a Medal of Honor winner from, from uh, uh, Vietnam. Uh, uh, I hope I'm getting my facts right here. That would be a terrible mistake. Pretty sure it was Vietnam. I remember the citation, reading it again and again, and this guy behaved in, 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 in such a, a brave way in a bad moment that, that of course he got the, uh, the highest award there mm -hmm. is. And one of the things that happened is inside the Pentagon, uh, there's a conference room uh, deep in the Pentagon called the Gardner Room, uh, this dark panel thing. 
And one of the meetings that would occur in the Gardner Room uh, while I was reporting this book was a meeting convened by the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army. The Vice. The Vice. Who is it? A guy named Pete Corelli. He yep. helped run the Iraq War for a while, came home, was promoted to Vice, and was given, one of his tasks was, you got to figure out what's happening with suicides. So in the Gardner Room, he would convene this monthly meeting, maybe 20 people around the table, video link-ups around the world, where they would spend two hours going through suicides. And, and wherever it happened, uh, if it was in Iraq, Afghanistan, Korea, wherever it was, uh, usually the, the commanding general of that particular place would pop up on screen, and he would have five minutes, basically, to explain what happened and lessons learned. The reason it was five minutes is because they had so many to get through. And in two hours, it's rare that they were able to keep up with the growing agenda of suicides to try to learn from. Isn't that something? And still do with an alarming rate of suicides. Well, the huh? suicide rates, as, as we know, uh, they, they have not gone away. Jesse Robinson, how, talk about his trip to the Gardner Room where he's mm. part of what they call a 37-liner? Yeah, Jesse um, Robinson report? was um, one of the guys who had his five minutes in the Gardner Room. Uh, in the book, uh, I, I, I talk about the process that, that allows one to show up in the Gardner Room, the questionnaire that has to be filled out and answered, and, and everything uh, his unit went through to get ready for the five-minute presentation to the vice. And that's followed by, by a long, long... Uh, examination of not his life in five minutes as a lesson learned, but all the things that happened to him from the time he returned from the war, uh, uh, his disintegration until his eventual suicide. Mm. You know, and as I talk about this, I'm, I, I am worried that, 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 that people might think that I'm portraying every soldier as a sad story. And again, I want to emphasize mm -hmm. that's not the case. Mm -hmm. but. But enough are having a hard time that I don't want to whitewash it and pretend that everything's fine either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, these are tough stories. They're intimately reported. Uh, but, but, but again, I, I, I don't know. I don't want to sound defensive, but I do want to make clear that we shouldn't pretend that this stuff isn't happening uh, because it is. It's, it's, it's just, and how could it not? You go to war. It's, it's, it's such an, it's, it, it's an indescribably extreme environment. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and these guys learn to operate in that environment. And then unlike World War II where you get on a ship and it kind of takes six weeks to make its way across the ocean, you get on a jet and you get on another jet and you're plopped down in the middle of yeah. normalcy. But yeah. you're still at that extreme tempo. And, and how can there not be friction points uh, when, when you're expected to return to normalcy like that? And... Let's talk a little bit about the professional care system. It is overwhelmed, it's strained, in some cases ineffective. Lord knows they're all trying. Yeah. The backlog is horrific. Yeah. Uh, I've read just news stories where people finally get to a point where they will seek help. Maybe they didn't in the past because of the stigma or the consequences. The stigma's still there. Yeah. I mean, let's not pretend it's not there. And, again, men yes. reaching out to a therapist, that right. kind of a thing. It can be tough, especially in mm -hmm. infantry. I, I, I think oh. that's true. So you introduce us to uh, habituation. What a term. Yeah, I know. What's it's that all something? about? Well, but it, 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 it's a term in one of the treatment programs. It's basically, I guess it, 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 it flows the word from habit, just returning to a traumatic event. Return uh, to again the traumatic and again, event. Enough times to gain some control over it. So, so instead of it, 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 it forcing you to almost cataclysmic reactions to it, you gain some control. It, I guess it has, um, it's the same thing or it's a version of cognitive processing therapy. You just process it again and again until you have some control. I mean, it's a theory. Mm -hmm. it seems to work for some guys, mm -hmm. some not so much. In, uh, in the book, you uh, talk about uh, the uh, hospital in Topeka, yeah. uh, Pueblo, uh, Colorado. Right. And uh, our, our friend uh, uh, Adam Schumann ends up at a place called Pathways. In California. In California. Yeah. Uh, not run by the military, I gather, but on the grounds of a military establishment. It is, right. He's there for how long? 
Well, so <laughs> here comes another short answer, I'm afraid. <laughs> How much time do we have, Tracy? <laughs> huh? <laughs> but he, he, here, here's the thing. Uh, uh, Ticello Ayeti uh, goes to a treatment program for PTSD that's seven weeks long, uh, run by the VA. Uh, along comes a, a guy I write about, another guy in the unit named Nick DeNino, who needs some help. Mm -hmm. And he wants to go there. Uh, they're full. There's a waiting list. Uh, the, the window to help a guy who finally stands up and says he needs help is pretty small. You've got, you got to get in there. Mm -hmm. So they look around and they find a program with a good reputation in Colorado. So Nick DeNino goes there. It's not seven weeks. This one is four weeks. Maybe a good program, but one's trying to heal you in four weeks, one in seven weeks. Now it's Adam Schumann's turn. He stands up. He needs help. Seven weeks, full four weeks, full. So his caseworker looks around and around and she finds this little program in Northern California that is not, there are no insurance mandates uh, that, that, that limit your stay to four weeks. Uh, there's not a VA program that limits it to seven weeks. This is all donor supported. A little program, four months minimum. Yep. So Schumann, by the luck of the draw, gets four months minimum to work through whatever's going on in his own head. And I'm not denigrating the other programs, I, but, but I think it's a fair conclusion that if Adam Schumann were my kid and I found out that, well, you know, we're, 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 we're putting him in the four-week one because that's where we have room, not because it's best suited to what's wrong yeah, with yeah, him, yeah, right. and he's not getting the seven weeks and he's not getting the four months, right. I'd say, give him the best shot possible. Wow, and his poor wife, Four months, now two kids, right? Yes. And she's just going enough. out of her mind. Yeah, but interestingly, if he had deployed, she wouldn't have minded. I mean, the deployment was 15 months. But he has come home. But he's come home. She called him a, a good guy, a broken guy. Yeah, he's a good guy. He's just a broken good he's guy. He's a broken guy. She said that in one of her compassionate moments. But she also had some she, very she, angry yeah, moments oh, she where she wasn't temper. capable of summoning compassion, ah. which makes sense. I mean, I mean, she had her set of expectations when she saw him walking across the tarmac, but then she got a good look at him and she knew she was in for something she wasn't expecting. And it went on and on and on and on. Mm. There's so much to, I wanna just talk, because uh, we're just down to the last couple of minutes. Um, you were embedded with them there. Mm -hmm. You're embedded with them now. Right. You've written these two incredible books. It's a strange question, but it came to me over the weekend as yeah. I was reading. Do you have dreams that border on anything that you've seen? Or? No, no. I mean, I, I mean, when I... When I uh, if the I'm, answer is no... No, I'm not going to be shy. I, I came home after, after eight months in Iraq living with these guys. I mean, it was frightening. Frightening. And, uh, and, and I got rattled. And... Uh, but you but got I, rattled. How so? It was tough. It was scary. I mean, they were I, under my bunk at times. You know, doing the the, the prayer bargain uh, out in convoys that got blown up. I mean, it, it was a war, right? So everybody got affected. The, I had a lot of advantages. So I could leave, unlike a soldier. I didn't have to carry a weapon. Mm -hmm. But most of all, I got to come home, and I think this is important um, to stress. I got to come home with this pile of notes, and spend most of a year shaping those, the chronology into a narrative, into a story that I tell in this book. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's amazingly cathartic. So, so I, one more luxury I got that soldiers don't get is I got to come home and consider a profound experience. How has it all changed your life? What, let me ask it a different way. What's, because of what you've done, because of what you've experienced, yeah. what's the biggest lesson that you've learned that you take with you on a day-to-day -day basis that helps you navigate in, in maybe a different way because well, of that experience? Well, maybe it's a, it's a total cornball answer. And if I've established any credibility, I'm about to lose it. But, but the thing was, I mean, it was war. And in the midst of this thing that, that was awful or potentially awful in every moment, every day there would be some small act of human decency that didn't have to occur soldier to soldier, soldier to Iraqi, Iraqi to soldier, whatever it was, every day would bring some reminder that 
that there are all kinds of ways we can define each other. And, and sometimes it's, it's a hopeful and a redemptive way. Mm. So I, I, I take that with me. Uh, let me call your attention to this incredible book, brilliantly written. The reporting is absolutely sensational. It's a painful book to read, but everyone should read it. It's called Thank You for Your Service. Our guest has been David Finkel. Just an amazing uh, programs, two programs with you discussing this very, very important book. Awesome. Thank you, David. Thank you, Dennis. Thank Appreciate you. It. Excellent. Appreciate it. For information about my new book, The Chance of a Lifetime, and online video for all This Is America programs, visit our website, thisisamerica.net. And now you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. This Is America is brought to you by the National Education Association, the U.S.-China Education Trust, and the F.Y. Chang Foundation. The League of Arab States, representing 350 million people in 22 member countries. The Rotondaro Family Trust. The Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy, presenting international artists in diplomatic settings. And Ventana Productions, television facilities, editing and distribution services.